Now let us gather together and sing Surely the Presence. Kevin will be back.
Wasn't that enchanting? Kevin, I had my eyes closed and I was sure you were playing multiple instruments. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was really special. So I'd like to welcome new listeners. We got our, our old posse here. Everybody here I recognize and welcome, and I'm so happy you're all here. A lot of people, because of the ice storm, I think are watching from home, so I welcome you as well. Happy to have you with us today. If you haven't already, please silence your cell phones or put them on vibrate so we don't get interrupted. Let us start with our daily word for today. Palm Sunday, and our affirmation is the Christ within protects and clears my way. As I enter Holy Week, I reflect on Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem and how the multitudes greet him, shout, greeted him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Like so many, I've used the sacred time of Lent to cleanse my soul of beliefs and habits that no longer serve me. I've felt blessed as I've opened my heart to the healing, cleansing waters of spirit. Now I feel ready to welcome a greater awareness of the Christ within me. Every part of me quivers with eager anticipation. The world seems fresh and I feel newly alive. I behold the Christ in me and in all others. With joy, I celebrate. With gratitude, I humbly bless the Christ in me and in everyone. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's the scripture from Matthew chapter 21, verse 9. Again, the affirmation for Palm Sunday is, the Christ within protects and clears my way. So if you've been here before, if you've heard our service before, you know that after service we enjoy fellowship with food and conversation and lots of jokes. And this is another way that um, we put our mission statement into action, that we're not just talking about it, we're doing it. We're creating community. So anytime you can, please join us. We have a mission statement, and if you would say it with me, I believe it'll be on the screen. Yes. We are a loving, nurturing community dedicated to being a positive path to spiritual living, to awaken oneness with God within us all. We dedicate this year to activating the abundance and prosperity in our lives with gratitude, love, action, and connecting to the divine within us and the world around us. So we broadcast live on our YouTube channel. Uh, but the easiest way to, to get us on Sunday services, especially, is just go to our webpage at unityoftheseacoast.org and then scroll down to the links for our live services or past services on YouTube or Facebook. There's also a blue button called Donate, and that allows you to support us in our outreach if you desire to, if we've inspired you at all. Or if you prefer, prefer to mail your donation, um, our mailing address is, and it's running across the bottom there, Unity of the Seacoast, McConnell Center, Suite 246, 61 Locust Street, Dover, New Hampshire, 03820. And also for details on events that are coming up, just go to our meetup page, please. And everything, all the details are on there. But briefly, upcoming events are, game night was scheduled for last night. I mean, Friday night. <laughs> and uh, new today, which we're all very excited about this, is after fellowship, we're going to have an acoustic circle hosted by Charlie Richard and with Mikey G. If you play an instrument or you just want to have fun music and join us, or if you want to sing with us or just sit and listen to us, please join us. It's noon to three. Now, we have a sound bath coming up this Friday, March 29th at 630. Um, I've met with this um, practitioner, and she's phenomenal. So join us as we welcome Lisa O'Shea, a certified sound healing therapist. And she's going to provide us with a deep meditation 
and then a sound bath. Admission is $20. April, lots of stuff, of course, going on. We have our Facebook uh, meditation, uh, Facebook Live only, first Monday meditation on April Fool's Day, Monday the 1st. <laughs> I'm not fooling, though. <laughs> and then we have our, uh, our new Reiki circle, um, Wednesday the 3rd, and that is 3 to 4. Five. We have uh, on Saturday the 20th, we've got poetry with Shane Moore, and I know you've heard us talk about it a lot. It truly is something to participate in, whether you write poetry or not. The, the discussions are, are educating and enlightening and entertaining. And then, of course, we have game night on Friday the 26th of April. Now we're going to do our greeting, our namaste greeting, which most of you are familiar with. It's really a beautiful way to greet someone, to really see the Christ in yourself, to be able to greet the Christ in someone else, or if you prefer, the best in yourself, to greet and honor the best in someone else. And we do this by putting our hands in prayer position, and looking deeply into someone's eyes and authentically and honestly greet them. Namaste. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It's like a laser beam. Someone said. Yep. So now I'll I will um, invite Kevin to play again for us. Thank you. I just got back um, last weekend from an actual, I haven't been to one of these in 12 years. They had a Native American flute festival. Nothing but Native American flutes for four days. Wow. Um, I drove down to, um, I don't know, in Delaware. It was about a seven hour drive for me. But man, was it worth it. I got to meet some of the, you know, up and coming well known players that were hosting workshops. and. And there were flute vendors, and you better believe I bought home food. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> My wife was like, did you buy a new flute? I'm like, you think I'm driving seven hours without buying home new flute? <laughs> I didn't tell her it was three, though. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one long time. Yeah, yeah. They connect. Yeah. They connect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've, my mind is my excitement for the instrument has kind of rejuvenated. So I'm hoping to get back into Man, I've been planning to, to do a recording on a native flute since, actually, I believe it would be 25 years now. Wow. <laughs> and I have not completed it yet. I have several tracks done. But man, I just, I think of that recording. close. Oh, I just, oh, the, the, the process of recording for me, because I can get up and do a live performance, and if I make a mistake, I'm like, that's okay. It's okay. I've finally dealt with that. But let me tell you, when you go to record something, you want it no, no, no perfect. Thank you. 
How how far back does the Native American food date? Oh, that's so cool that you asked me that <laughs> because they had workshops last week with this guy. His name is John Norris. He's out of North Carolina. He has kind of taken up the mantle of studying the Native American food and its origins. Um, I started playing this flute 25 years ago back when I first started trying to make a recording. And there were different people that were kind of collecting and bringing forward the story of the flute, but a lot of those have passed now. So this new guy, he's, he's, he gathered it all up and he's really knowledgeable and he gave these classes. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because there's a lot of misconceptions about the flute. This flute and the way it's constructed and the way it's tuned is really, the first example of it was probably about 1982. Well, not really all that old, is it? No. No. These are Native American style flutes. Native American flutes made by Native Americans. I mean, if you want to count the other style of flutes that they made, they go back thousands of years. Um, the Hopi flutes, they're, 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 they're a totally different style of instrument. This style of instrument with the separate air chambers, they, have, they finally found one with the same similar construction that was probably about a thousand years old. Wow. But the, 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 the early native flutes, they did not have the same tuning as these. Um, they were tuned, a lot of people used to say that they were tuned using body measurements, and some, some of that's true, but really when they go back and they study the early recordings that were made in the eight, late 1800s, um, they're really, they're, they're diatonic major scales. These are pentatonic minor scales, um, and that, these, this tuning was applied to the flute in 1982 by a guy named Michael Graham Allen, who was making replica flutes of the old flutes from the Native Americans, and just really realized that the scales and the sounds of the flutes, I wish I bought my flute, I could play for you what, it, what an early Native flute sounded like. Mm -hmm. Totally different from this. Well, not totally, but really different from this. And to a lot of people, the sound of those early flutes is actually very unpleasant. Um, and the, the flute songs were actually meant to mimic actual vocal songs from the Native American repertoire. Unpleasant because we're used to that regular We're scale. used to this, we're Depending used to, to modern Western tuning. So to our ears, the, the, so, and, and it's also a very harsh, um, a lot of the early flutes also had something called a warble built into the flute, which means when you play the bottom note, it will make a sound like whoa, 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 whoa. it's very loud. Um, and a lot of people find it unpleasant. I'm actually starting to get into it. And I bought a flute that this guy who I mentioned, John Norris, um, I bought a flute that he makes that actually enables you to get that tune just by moving the block. So it's both a modern instrument and I can get the old sound off. Wow. So I'm gonna start, I wish I brought it, that would have been perfect. So next time. to answer your question, these flutes are probably only about what? 40 years old, but the, the, the style of flute that they're based on can be traced back about 200 years or so, with one possible example going back a thousand years. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. So now we've had our dessert. It's time to put our listening ears on and open our minds and our hearts releasing anything that no longer serves us, and get ready for the Reverend Thomas Scheinler. Thank you. So I have been out of sorts all day. Um, even sitting back there, the cord was draped across my glasses and trying to get it undone. Um, we woke up with no power, so I didn't get to shower, and I didn't think it mattered, except for most of the service. I've been sitting back there alone. Everyone was on this side, <laughs> so apparently it does matter. I didn't get to print my talk. I did when I got here, but the order of service, or go through things the way I normally did. Um, I'm so thankful, Lynn, that you were facilitating because she is the comp. She knows this order of service. She knows the way things work here, so I don't have to think about it. Um, and when I printed the order of service this morning, I printed last week. So, but she had the right one with her. So, Lynn, thank you. 
And this is Palm Sunday, and as you know, I don't often do things by the book. I had a whole other talk written. Um, the talk I kind of liked, but I woke up Friday and thought, I can't do this talk. So I, um, I'll put that off for another couple weeks or so. Um, and the reason I decided to change is that for the past month, as you guys know, I've been locked into this course I've been taking on learning home dialysis so I can do all the things that I need to do at my house. Um, and it's quite intense. Basically, I'm becoming a dialysis nurse. I have to learn to calculate how much fluid to take off, how much time to be on it, every emergency event, the sterile connection thing, um, the machines, or how to make the fluid, that the, the dial site. And it just, it's really, really quite a lot. Um, Casey knows she went Friday and she'll go Monday because she has to know in the event of an emergency how to um, get me off the machine without me bleeding all over the house and ruining the carpet. Um, <laughs> so I've been wrapped up in this to the point that I've not been noticing a lot that goes on around me. I get home and I study again, and if I'm lucky, I'll practice my guitar while I fall asleep on the couch. And then to complicate that, I've had restless leg syndrome, which wakes me up and it keeps me up all night. So I've had tunnel vision and I've not noticed the world around me, and I regret that. Because people have stuff going on. The world keeps moving. Stuff keeps happening. I saw on Facebook a friend of mine passed away, childhood friend. I had not seen him since high school. But it still struck me, and I thought, his family must be going through just a tough time. And then I called, and I, I spoke to some people this week, and I realize everyone's hurt. Everyone is going through something. And even if my life is busy, my stuff is minute. It's an inconvenience. You know, I have to change my diet. I, I adjust how physical I'm going to be, whatever. You know, I have to get up at 4 a.m. instead of 5 or whatever. These things are just inconvenient. They're not major stuff. And when I talk to other people, I realize they have stuff that's pretty damn heavy. And I have to have empathy and compassion. And we all have to have empathy and compassion. We need to assume that people have stuff going on. We expect people to show up and be fine and jolly in every moment. And when they're not, we struggle internally with that. Like, what did I do? Why are they acting like this way? not giving them the same benefit that we would give ourselves, like, hey, man, I got stuff going on. Well, maybe they're not saying it, but maybe that's their way of saying it by just not being in the frame of mind that you would hope them to be. So take a minute when dealing with everyone to, to just step back, to, to be kind and rewind. Step back to really hear what they're saying. Take a moment to listen. Take a moment to try and understand what they might be going through. You know, I adjust my diet. I adjust my certain foods or whatever. But after talking to people this week, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to that. Imagine losing your home or being faced with a job loss or a debt that's just not affordable. Maybe your income does not match the inflation rate. Or you're making choices on what to buy to cover your bills or to get something to eat, or maybe choosing less medication so you can choose electricity or rent or food. I was able to speak to a representative this week of Andy Custer. They came into the dialysis center and they asked, oh, you should speak to Tom. And the lady didn't seem that interested. Afterward, we had this great conversation about what other patients go through and how many other patients are back on dialysis because they can no longer afford their anti-rejection medicines. So they make that choice to let their kidney fail 
so they can eat and pay their bills. And it's funny because when you get a transplant, they will cover your medication for three years. They'll cover transplants over and over again, but they'll cover the medication for three years. It never made sense to me. The cost for transplants far outweighs the cost of medication. But people make these kind of life choices all the time. You know, maybe someone's facing an illness or their loved one is. Maybe their depression is kicking into high gear or their car is failing and they can't afford to fix it. Maybe the stress of being a parent or a spouse is just too much in this moment. Take time to step back. Take time to listen. People are going through things, and although they may not tell you, it is still happening. Be the light. Be the pillar to others. You don't have to add to the weight by unloading or judging or assuming their anger or issues or about you. When when you react with adversely or you know or tough, that carries. When you act with kindness, that carries as well. Your kindness carries. Even if they're disagreeing with you, even if they're angry, step back a moment and say, well, thank you for, for that, or whatever you can do to add and uplift. Because the majority of people have stuff they're going through that would knock others for a loop. And I asked Bonnie this week if I could talk about this, and she graciously said yes. Bonnie's daughter died this past week. And I was honored to be able to take Bonnie to see her last Sunday. We spent the good part of the day together, and Bonnie knew that it would be the last time that she would see her. Imagine that. Imagine going through that. Bonnie's daughter, Brenda, had been battling lewd body dementia for years. Her boyfriend, a man that she knew in high school and ran into later in life, was by her side. He took care of her every day, and I mean every day, doing every possible thing from meds to cleaning her, to helping her walk, to pushing her in a wheelchair, to caring for her when she was bedridden, to talking with her and having conversations when she could no longer clearly verbalize. Folks, that stress, if you saw this guy rushing around the supermarket and cut you off, would you think, what a jerk? Or would you take the time to think, maybe he's going through something? Just let him have his way. Be sympathetic. Be kind. Just don't wait and assume that we know the reason. Don't wait to assume, to assume that we think, Man, what a pain in the ass. You're not thinking about anyone else. People are going through stuff. Brenda's daughter, imagine going through that, being intact in mind while the body fails you and you have to adjust to that disease. Imagine our Bonnie, all the emotions that she'd been going through. Think of the things that you go through and step back and be kind to yourself. Give yourself a break. You're allowed to step back. You're allowed to cry to get better. You're allowed to let go. You're allowed to hold on to anger and hurt for a while. Your emotions are there for a reason. Allow them to do their job. And when you're interacting with other people, allow yourself to see yourself in them. And by that, I mean, assume that they could be going through stuff as well. You cannot imagine all the things that others go through. I cannot imagine what Bonnie's feeling. This talk, Bonnie, is for you, is for your daughter, and for your daughter's boyfriend. And I'm not going to mention his name because I've not asked him and I didn't want to give away his privacy. Grief is overwhelming emotion, but we allow it to do its job. It shows how much we have loved and that we have loved others. Jesus teaches this when Lazarus dies. It's the shortest verse in the Bible and one of the most powerful. John 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. His friend had just died, and he has grief, and he cries. And he's showing us that it is okay to cry, to weep, to feel emotions, and to express them. Whatever you're going through, step back and let it out. Cry if you need to. The next verse is, see how much he loved him. 
the people could see his love in his grief. Jesus wept. It's okay. And then he did something amazing. He turned his attention to Lazarus and he rose and Lazarus was filled with a new life. This is symbolic. When the grief passes, we can turn our attention towards that person and they become alive within us. We can feel and hear the words that they might say. I hear my brother speak often when I tell a joke. I know it's his voice telling that joke. I would have, he would have said the same thing. You'll see and hear things that remind you of the ones that you have lost. And those will be, things become a new relationship with that person. You learn the physical disappear, but the spirit remains, and somehow it interacts in your life. You've been influenced by them, and they have memories, and those memories become a comfort. Eventually, they become fun to think and talk about it. Jesus turned his attention to Lazarus, and he rose. Turn your attention toward that person. You will see things and hear things that remind you of them. And eventually you will hear their voice. You will hear their wisdom. Things will enter your mind. Memories will comfort you. You'll see things that remind you of them. Those memories, that's what they're there for. Everything becomes a memory as soon as the moment passes. It's a gift from God. And we choose how to use those memories. The ability to hold parts of everyone when they're gone is such an amazing ability. Those memories and those new thoughts we have from that person become the new life. That's how the person rises again within us. Bonnie, I want you to know how much you have honored me by letting me be this little part of this. And you are loved. Bonnie's daughter's full name was Brenda Jo Pistario. She went to MIT. She, she taught at MIT, right? Worked there for 22 years. She was brilliant. And hold her close. Hold Bonnie close in your thoughts this week. You know, for everyone, life is always going on. And there is stress. Each one of us, we're a great community. And we can set that example of love. We do that each week here. But we get wrapped up in our own things. Allow others the same. Take time to think. Maybe they're going through their stuff. We have this great ability of compassion and empathy. It's an amazing thing. It's not limited to us. We see it in animals do that. Some animals will protect others for whatever reason. But we can do it on this whole other level. And sometimes we interpersonalize it and we take the wrong reason. Allow people to have those moments. And again, allow yourself to have those moments. You are going to go through stuff. Take time to cry and to pray and to be sad. Do what you need to do to care for yourself. Step back if you need to. Be loving to yourself. Ask for a hug from someone. If you need to stay home and watch a movie on the couch, then grab a blanket and a sandwich and do so. It does not matter. Take care of yourself. One of the reasons we're here is to take care of each other, to be tender, to be loving, to be a safe place for all who come in contact with us. It's simple. It's We can be that safe place for each person in each new moment. They may be having a bad day, and you don't know it. But when they come and talk to you, and maybe they even do know it, just be safe. You don't have to be the hero. Being safe is enough. Being kind is enough. You set that mind stuff and thank them. Be courteous. We watched a movie on Mr. Rogers. Maybe we'll play that one day here. Amazing how he turned everything into kindness. Um, and I saw a documentary on him years ago, and he was that guy. We had gone to a church where the minister was his childhood friend. Said he was that way always. He dealt with stuff. He had a lot of stuff. But he dealt with it by making the world a better place in every contact he made with someone else. It's a great stress break. 
And when you do that, you become the master of living in the moment. It's very hard to be wrapped up in our stuff and not see the world. I've been that way for the past month, and I regret that. At the same time, I'm so thankful to be part of a community that allowed me to make a mistake or to not see everything I should. So my point is, stuff is going on for everyone. We have to notice it. I'm glad I woke up Friday and thought about this. And I humbly thank each one of you. Step away for a song and then we'll do a meditation. So funny how I can be starstruck by people that other people don't even know exist. <laughs> but um, I, I had heard one of his songs several years ago. And it was absolutely stunning. I loved it. He's called um, Trillion Fairies. And um, but there was this one part that I could never figure out what he was doing. And so I finally got the chance last week to ask him, what are you doing? What are you doing there? I'm so excited. I still don't know what he's doing. <laughs> but he basically said what I'm doing is fine. <laughs> so this is that song, it's called Trillium Fairies. What's the title again? Trillium Fairies. It's basically he went off to he used to live out in California and he went out into this redwood forest that he normally went to. But this particular time that he went out, the floor of the forest was covered with trillium flowers that had bloomed. Uh, they normally weren't there, and he was just totally inspired by it and wrote the piece right there. Wow.
loud noise, but you're going to... Everyone at home hear that? Are you awake now? For those at home, we apologize for last week. The internet went out, it flashed out, and when it did, it locked us out of the um, of getting back into the the room and doing it. So um, we kind of got back in, and there's a recording of part of it, but I haven't been able to snag it yet. Once I do, I will get that online. And I want to thank Frank for stepping in last week and talking. Um, I got great comments about it, which I, I didn't doubt that I would, but um, thank you. It made me able to take the day off and um, do the things I needed to do. Having said that, we will start by doing our, our prayer for others. We take a deep breath. And we take this moment to think about us and our neighbors and our friends and our community and the world around us. We know that any moment anyone is fighting a battle that they find difficult or struggle with. Maybe we find it difficult and we struggle with our battles. But we know that we are all connected, that we can all help each other, we can lift each other. In this prayer, do it through Jesus the Christ and our connection to God. We hold each other as high as we can. We elevate them consciously in health and wisdom and happiness, in peace. We see each person as whole and fed and strong. And we give the power that we have in ourselves to other. We offer that so they may use us when they don't have the strength. We can be that person, even if it's just for a moment, to raise them and see them in their whole and healthy and best self. We do this from the Christ within us. So it is. Amen. Amen. Now I'd like each one of you to take a breath. In and out. Find your own comfortable breathing pattern. As we remember, there is only one presence in our lives and in the universe. God, the good and great omnipresence. As we know, God is love and wisdom, and we are the image of that. Think to yourself that I am love and wisdom. I am whole, and I am happy. I have the ability within me to conquer all life's issues. I am abundant, and I am strong. I am caring, and I am tender. I am a beacon, and I am safe. Allow those thoughts to run through you.
even at times when it doesn't feel so, know that you are safe, loving, abundant, and caring. That you are whole. Using the eyes of God and yourself as perfect. We were born from perfection into perfection. We don't allow the world to corrupt that. Each one of us is loved. I ask you to come back to me. Just take in the moment for a second. I'm going to ask Lynn to help me with the collections. You are welcome. And if you join me for the prayer of tithes and offerings, divine love as me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Amen. And join me now for the prayer of protection. The light of God surrounds me. The love of God enfolds me. The power of God protects us. Presence of God watches over me. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well, and we are richly blessed. If you guys want to know why we mess up me and us all the time, because we have two different versions written up here. <laughs> so thank you so much. Join us for the peace song if we can pull it up. Um, next week is Easter, our Easter service.